Hello, everyone. Let's see who else has joined. Let me share my screen. Uh, we'll wait for uh, others to join in, and then we can give it a start. Um, I see Rohi has joined in. Let me quickly confirm. Uh, hi, Rohi, can you hear me? Hello, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, so most probably Sarang will also join in. So uh, we will go ahead, uh, we'll start the session and then we'll see how uh, it goes. So it has been quite some time. There was a big gap. I hope you had a nice uh, holiday. I hope you had a good uh, Diwali as well. Uh, so uh, keeping that in mind, let's just quickly revise what uh, we did until the last session. And what we were doing uh, is that, um, uh, give me one moment. So what we were doing uh, uh, until um, the last session is that we have created the model, then we looked into some techniques, uh, and then uh, we we have looked into a few graphical techniques as well as a few mathematical techniques where we found out what is the best or what will be the best trade-off uh, irrespective of the fact that we found out the uh, uh, the operating curve as well as the AUC, right? So uh, we found out the receiver operating curve as well as the area under the curve, but that did not reveal much because for that to reveal much, we have to uh, compare a lot of models by creating not one, but more than one model, right? But uh, what we have done instead is that we have gone with one model and then we have tried to find out what should be our best threshold, right? So to do that, we created a table like this. And from here, we found out that the best threshold seems to be 0 0.3 because this is where uh, accuracy is acceptable and sensitivity and specificity is actually comparable, right? So that's what we decided. We should not have much gap between this. So this is one way. This is for people who like, let's say, numbers. But then if this table goes large, then it, it really becomes a problem. So a graphical way is also, also really very easy. So we took the data frame where we had this uh, information. We called the plot function and we called the line function within the plot function. We passed x and y. In x, we passed the probability. Or, or the uh, uh, the probability value which should uh, be used as that uh, benchmark or it should be used as uh, the decision boundary. And in Y, uh, we uh, have graphed accuracy as well as sensitivity as well as the specificity. And what we are looking for is this point. So this point is the intersection point. And if I take a line, and go from this point until the x-axis, approximately it is equal to 0 0.3. I can't say it is exactly equal. So uh, exactly equal would have been something like this. Uh, exactly equal will be something like here. Uh, it's approximately equal. So 0 0.32 maybe is going to be the right thing, but we will go with 0 0.3. And then what we did, we created this, uh, new column, final uh, predicted column in our already existing uh, data frame, white and red final, where we have taken the churn probability, we've used a map function. Inside the map function in the bracket, we've used a lambda function. What we are doing in the lambda function is we are taking a threshold as 0 0.3. If the value of churn probability is more than 0 0.3, I assign it a value of one, else I assign it a value of zero. So this is what I have done until now. So what I have to do now is that I have to look at the metrics. I obviously uh, have to look at the metrics to understand if I've created a good model or not. So to do that, I know I have three metrics. Let's go by one uh, or the, each and every one of them. 
So I have accuracy score. Uh, metrics dot accuracy score. Here I'm going to pass y uh, train red final dot final uh, predicted. So that's what column I'm going to pass. And I'm going to compare that with y train red final dot churn. So that's the actual value compared with the predicted value. So if I do that, I get an accuracy of 76% approx. Let's see what the table was saying, 7624. And this is also 7624. So we have done a quite a good job. It's not bad. So, uh, <clears throat> right, so uh, if, if what happens if I increase this to 0 0.32, let's say. So if I increase this to 0 0.32, the accuracy has slightly increased, but I should not be drafted towards that, that thing because I have to maintain the sensitivity and the specificity also. So uh, to get the sensitivity and the specificity, what we need to do is that we have to, first of all, create the a confusion matrix. So uh, to get the confusion matrix, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the confusion matrix function and I will pass the these two values in them. So the actual and the predicted is going to be passed on to them and hence I get the uh, thing, the output. It's quite good. I mean, it's not really bad. If you look, majority of the data is falling on the diagonals, on the right diagonal. So that's a quick indicator of whether your model is good or bad. So if you look at this this diagonal, these are the truths, the ones which you expected and it came as expected, right? So these are the values where uh, actual is equal to predictor. So this is a good number as opposed to these two numbers. If you look at these two, it's like uh, something close to what? Uh, 23 plus nine is 32 and it will be eight and 11. So one, one, three, two. One, one, three, two points are, uh, uh, incorrectly classified as opposed to a lot of other points, which is like 2790, 3790, right? So 3790, let me just clear the drawings, am I right? 2760 plus 1030, yes. So rather than doing it like this, why not do it here using Python? So what we are going to calculate uh, is that we have to calculate the, uh, uh, the sensitivity, which is true positive divided by true positive plus false and negative. And to do that, what we have to do, we will calculate true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. <coughs> okay. Uh, give me one minute, friend. Okay, so to do this, what we are going to do, uh, true positive, of course, uh, is going to be uh, the confusion matrix, uh, which is, I have to store the matrix. Let me just store it, confusion. I'm going to name it confusion only. So confusion is this, and I can see this. So confusion is basically an array. This, this function gives a uh, return as an array. So I'm going to do, confusion and from here I'm going to select one comma one. This is my true positive. Okay, one comma one becomes my true positive and uh, zero comma zero becomes my true negative. Okay, uh, zero comma zero. So I'm going to do confusion zero comma zero. Okay, so this is my true negative. One comma one is my true positive. And then the rest I can also decipher in the same way. What I can do is that uh, I can do uh, confusion and this one will be 0 comma 1 so this is this one right false positive is this one and false negative okay false negative is going to be confusion 1 comma 0 which is going to be this one 309 right so once I have calculated these values I'm sure these values are already calculated in the right way right true positive true negative false positive and false negative Right, so we have already calculated the value. Now I can calculate the sensitivity. Okay, sensitivity is going to be 
in brackets something divided by something so i'm going to take in the numerator for sensitivity it will be true positives okay and in the denominator it is going to be true positive plus false negative plus false negative right i can even convert this into a float but i don't want to do that it gives me 76.92 let's see what was our initial finding in that table so it is 78 i believe uh, the sensitivity has uh, uh, decreased i think 0.3 will be good but it's fine let's go ahead with this let's see what is going to be the specificity okay the specificity uh, on the other hand uh, is going to be true negative okay true negative divided by true negative plus false positive so this is the formula so what i'm going to do i'll put the brackets over here and i'll put more brackets specificity is going to be 77 this is good i mean you see if you round both the numbers it is equal to 77% only right i mean if you if you just round them to 2 multiplied by 100 and round them to sorry round them to 2 you get a 76.92 and the same applies over here also 77.03 will be the value right so it it's not bad it's really good and the reason why i call this really good is because if you look at these three values okay they they are into quite good range they are in the 77% range so this is a very good model i would say this is really a good model because it is a stable model you don't have anything which is on the higher side anything which is on extremely low side and so on and so forth so we have good things right we we have really good thing in place right so um now what we can do until this point in time i hope there are no doubts let me take a quick pause over here to see if there are any any issues or any questions please go ahead um if not then what we can do is that uh i'm going to quickly show you uh one more way uh of Uh, uh calculating this um uh, matrix right so uh, one more way of calculating the matrix will be from sk learn dot matrix import okay import precision okay uh, uh precision score and recall score right so if i do this then i already have the functions to do the precision score and the recall score that is also quite helpful so i can do a precision score of y train pred final here i'm going to pass churn which is the actual value and y train pred final dot final predicted is going to be my predicted value so this is my precision score so what is precision score precision score is basically uh true positive divided by true positive plus false positive okay so the precision and recall are also also two methods by means of which you can find out how good or how bad the model is as of now we will not go into depth of what is precision score and what is recall score because this is not the right example okay we can just look at these values for now just look at these values just have to remember that we have functions we have seen what is uh, precision or what is a recall right but when we go into other machine learning problem that's where we will see the actual uh, use of precision and recall right because this is not the right use case where we can really define the importance of precision and recall we'll take some other use cases but overall if if i look into mathematics then uh, uh, precision okay precision is basically if i want to write it is true positive divided by true positive plus false positive okay okay so precision is basically uh, uh the ratio of how much correctly identified positive points as opposed to all the identified positive points so even if they are true or if and if they are false so that is the precision it it tells us how good we are in correctly identifying the one points or the one uh, uh crosses so if you have a model if you try to imagine you have a model like this we have crosses as one class 
and zero and another class and you have created the decision boundary by means of which you have fit the logistic regression model by creating the decision boundary here right so how much well have we predicted these values right that's the precision okay it is just a score it is not a percentage it is not an accuracy measure in the same way uh, a recall okay a recall uh, is going to be something like what is the percentage of true positive that we have identified properly okay as compared to the true positives and the false negatives okay the true positives and the false negatives right so if if i look at this this is not as straightforward as the precision this this has more weightage in my view because this is telling us more about how practical my model is okay how practical my model is so that is the point over here because it is taking into account true positive let me just uh, take an eraser and remove this uh, because it might create a confusion so true positive plus false negative right so it is taking the ratio of how many correctly identified positive points are there as opposed to currently identified positive points plus falsely identified negative points so this is a good measure of the overall strength of the model right that's the point that uh, we we are trying to find out okay so if i look over here my recall score is good my precision score is not that good right but this is not a place as i said to discuss these things because this is not the right use case this is really not the right use case uh, where we should be discussing these things because we are discussing about telecom churn this is a business problem in a business context it is almost always the case that you have a model which we have already created right so this is the model that we have right now i put this model into production even if i have or even if i have not so good amount of let's say accuracy my company or or, or my client okay is not going to fire me okay i if i am communicating the results in the right way what i would do essentially is i'll go with version 1 in prod and then i'll go to version 2 with a new change i'll go to version 3 with more iterations i'll go to version 4 with even more improvements and so on so i have the scope to improve the versions if you know what i mean in any business problem that's the case obviously uh, i'm not saying there wouldn't be escalations or there wouldn't be Uh, a, a kind of question on your let's say capabilities or some kind of doubt factor will creep in and so on so that kind of operational or uh, organizational problems will be there because we we all are human beings right i mean if we are looking at an outcome in front of our eyes and we don't uh, believe that then we tend to say that we don't really believe that so uh, that kind of problems will be there but barring that if i ignore that fact then i can go to production with my model um maybe at a very later stage we'll also see how to go to production there is a very nice library known as pickle so that pickle library will help us to put things into production in a really really nice way but let's ignore that for now just imagine that you have a production server it's not local host it is a production server where you have this this jupiter notebook which is already running and i am going to pass some unseen data to this model which i have created and that model will will actually give me the predictions now obviously i have the scope to update my versions from time to time right and this process is going to continue i'm going to take new data then i'm going to do more to processing and then come back to my modeling and so on and so forth right but nobody is going to cry much it's it's not going to be the end of the world but if now imagine this was not a this was not a business problem but let's say this was a healthcare problem okay if this was a healthcare problem then a lot of things a lot of uh, such calculations like recall and uh, precision and sensitivity and specificity these kind of things or their importance is really going to change they will have a new color now right because now it is more about being right the first time as much as really possible because now it is the question of how important the finding is and not about how good or how bad your code is that evil is gone we we will no longer be bothered about let's say software engineering principles when we are talking about uh, healthcare and related uh, domains right so in that case we will see 
if if we are able to take some examples, we will see what is the real meaning of precision and recall. But as of now, you can simply imagine, or you can simply understand the precision and recall, just like sensitivity and specificity, are two measures to analyze how strong the model is in the form of how much variation it has captured. Right. Now. Uh, Let's go ahead. I hope there are no questions. If if anyone has any questions, please raise their hands or maybe uh, you can unmute yourself and ask. Um, now, what we are going to do, as of now, what we have done is we have only okay, we have only uh, uh, looked into um, the uh, steps which we have performed. Let's say, okay, on the training data, okay. So we have only looked into uh, the training data because we are playing around with the model with our training data. Our uh, model is there, okay, but we don't, or we have not really validated it on our test uh, data. So that's exactly what we are going to do now. So we're going to make some predictions on the test set. So for that, I know that I have X test. I think I have written the spelling wrong. That's why it's going to give me an error. So I have X test and I have Y test, right? So uh, let's see what is the shape. So I have 2000 rows and in Y, I obviously I will have 2000 rows only, but I have only one column. So that's why it is comma and then there is nothing. So it's like an array, you can say. So <clears throat> you can say this is the case, All right? So it is just a series, but uh, if you look at X test, it's going to be a data frame, right? Now, what we are going to do, we are going to take care of the scaling part. We have already done the scaling part in the training uh, case. I believe scalar is the, is the function which we use. So what we are going to do, we have to scale those three numerical variables. If you remember, we have to scale those three numerical variables which were the continuous variables. Who were those? Uh, let's try to understand. I believe I have forgotten their names. So why not do one thing? Insert cell below. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I can do that. Why not? Because I just need the list of columns. Yeah, so I need these three. Right, these are the three that I need. So I'll just remove this part and say this one, right? So why do I need these three is because these are the uh, continuous fields, right? And we have already scaled them when it came to the training data. That's exactly what I'm going to do now. So scalar dot, I believe the, uh, uh, the function was transform, right? So I'm going to do a transform, okay? Now there is a difference between the transformation that I'm doing over here and the transformation that I did earlier. So what I did earlier was a fit transform, okay? Now there is a difference between fit transform and transform. I would like you to find out what is the difference, okay? Because this is a very important thing that we should understand. What is the difference between scaling of data by fitting it on the data and by only transforming the data? So how does it change? Okay, how does it change things? Or why in this case, uh, specifically in the training data, we did a fit transform on the scalar object. And now we are doing a transform on the uh, uh, on the scalar object because we are using the test data. Okay, I'm not going to answer that question. Maybe we can discuss in our group yeah, why, why we did that. Okay, so now what we have done is we have scaled the data Okay, let's see what all columns I have. Yeah, so I have all the columns which are there. Uh, then call the 15 uh, columns are there, but uh, uh, then I'm just trying to verify your friends. If I have uh, I have the right set, no. Uh, I think I have to take it from here. Uh, so why did I select call? Okay, yes, of course, yes, yes. I selected call because these are my uh, selective selective list of columns. So this is the reason why we should not have breaks. Right after this long break of three to four days, I actually forgot what all, uh, let's say, variables I had. 
So okay, now what I will do? X test SM is equal to uh, I have to do that add the constant thing, right? Because I'm going to use stats models, so I have to do add constant, and add constant will be on X test, right? So I have this X test SM now. Okay, where I've added a constant and the value of constant is always one. This is the intercept that that uh, the stats model really requires. Okay, so that's what I have done, but I think I've done a mistake. I should have what I should have. Yeah, yes, yes. So I should have what I should have done is something like this. Let me just insert a cell below and I should do this. X test is actually equal to X test for the selected columns only. I should not do it for all the columns. I should do it only for the 15 columns which I had selected. I hope you remember why we are doing it on the 15 columns because the basis, the P value, we removed four of the columns where the P value was insignificant, right? Now what we are going to do, we are going to make the predictions. Okay, we already have the model. The model is stored where, let's try and find where the model is stored. Right? I believe the uh, variable name was RES, but let's just quickly see. Um, <coughs> let's see where the, <coughs> yeah. see, here it is. So we have RES model, which is created from stats models already. So what I'm going to do, why uh, pred? Okay, I'm going to name a variable like this, why pred or even better, I'm going to name it as y test spread. I'm going to store the value rest dot predict. Okay, rest dot predict. I'm going to pass x test, sorry, x test sm. Okay, it is giving me some error. Why is it giving me an error? Uh, I have added the constant also, right? Should not give me an error. Let's see. Uh, Dimension one or the y, 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 y. Let me see. X test. This should be test. Yeah, it is the same thing. I, I shouldn't have done anything wrong over here. So, X test already have all the columns. And what did I do? X test. I selected X test. And. Um, then I have passed on this value x just to add the constant and this. Okay, so let me just see what I did earlier. Maybe there's something which I'm missing, which I'm not able to remember properly. So let me go back and see what I did earlier. Yeah, values dot reshape minus one. I believe this is something I need to do over here also. No. No, it shouldn't work because X test, uh, yeah, I mean, this should work, right? Okay, uh, not sure why this is not really working. There is some problem, it seems. Uh, yeah, there seems to be some problem here. Okay, so what can we do? Uh, let me just see. What, uh, yeah, Sarang is joining in as well. Let me admit him. So, what did I do actually? X test dot shape, X test is 15 columns. Okay. Let me just do one thing. Let me run on the columns once and I'm not. Uh, yeah. What is the error? It is saying there are. Twelve. There are twelve in RES. Why is RES like this? Let me see the previous model. How many columns? Are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, that's where the issue is. The issue is I have not used the right column set. Let me just go above. Uh, hi, Sarangsha. I hope you can hear us, right? Yeah, but my, yeah, I was facing some issues. Huh. Uh, actually, my Wi-Fi is not on. I couldn't connect on normal network. Okay. Connected on 
Ah, yes. See, this is the final uh, thing. I, this is very confusing. Actually, I should write this down somewhere because causing a lot of problems. Man. So rather than using call, I have to use call five. So what is the difference? I have only 11 columns. This is the reason why I was not able to do this. Now what I have to do, you know, I have to rerun everything. I have to rerun everything because otherwise it wouldn't run. Next test dot columns, I have 15 columns. Why should I have to rerun? Let's see. Yeah, it should work now. It should work now. It has 12 columns and I am not going to do any reshape. Let's see if this works. Otherwise, we are going to rerun. Yeah, it worked. It worked. If I do a summary, I have a good model. I don't have any P value, which is very high or very low. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the Y test spread I've got. Very, very simple, silly mistake I did. I selected the wrong uh, place or the wrong list of the columns, right? So what uh, we are going to do now is that I'm going to create a data frame, okay? I'm going to create a data frame again by using Y, uh, y test spread. This is my data that I've already collected. So Y test, uh, what can I name it? Uh, y spread one, okay? Y predicted one is PD dot data frame and then what we are going to do y test spread i think i have written it correctly yeah so y red one now looks like this okay so it doesn't have any columns i will put the column at a later stage so not an issue so let me just uh, do this um so now what i need okay you will soon understand what i'm trying to do why test df i'm creating the data frames pd dot data frame and here i'm going to pass y test so i just want to create a final let's say data frame where i can compare the results so that's what i'm doing so i got a data frame of the predictions now i've got a data frame of the test right or the or the actual ones all right uh, so these are the actual ones. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a customer ID. So Y test DF is similar to what we uh, did for uh, the trading case also, right? We created a data frame where, where we got all the values, pieces, the thresholds and so on and so forth. So that is what we are doing, uh, right? So, let me see if I've done this uh, correctly. Yes, I have given a customer ID, which is good. And now what I would like to do is that uh, before I join these two data frames, what is Y pred one and Y test DF, because they both contain two parts of the answer. So what I will do, I will do a reset index. This is a very important operation. Pred one, okay, Y pred one, the reset index. Okay, what I'm going to say, x uh, drop is equal to true. Okay, drop is equal to true. I'm going to explain why I'm doing this. In place is equal to true. Okay, now the reason why I did this is because if you look at y pred one, when I created y pred one, right, it has automatically given it an index. I don't want this index. I want to index it by the customer ID because this is the actual index I would like to use. Right. This is the actual index I would like to use. I don't want any additional index. So this is just an additional step that I'm doing just to make my data frames look good. So I'm going to do the same thing with white test DF, reset index, reset index with these two parameters. I'm going to save time by not uh, typing them. And then I have Y pred one, which now looks like this. Right, so I have no more index. I've just resetted the index to a serial order. And now I have Y test DF. This is also going to look like this. So the indexes are actually resetted, right? And why I did that is because now I can easily join them. And how I'm going to join them is this Y pred final. Okay, uh, I'm going to take this 
as, as a new data frame where I'm going to do a PD or a pandas concat. Okay, a concatenation operation will be done on columns x is equal to one, and I would like to concatenate two data frames. Hence, I'm going to mark it as a list. So I'm going to concatenate. The first one is going to be the test df, let's say. The second one is going to be my y red one, right? So if I do this, I get a final uh, uh, data frame, which contains the right order of indexes, the right customer ID and, and the uh, zero thing. Now, what is this zero? This zero came from this y red one. So I have to rename the column, okay? I have to rename the column. So how do you rename the column is that y red final dot rename. You can use this rename function, okay? And inside the rename function, what we have to use columns, okay? Uh, columns, and here you have to pass a dictionary. So in the dictionary, you have to mention what you want to rename to what. So zero should be renamed to churn probability. Okay, or churn probability, sorry. Now, I have not done in place equal to true. That's the reason why uh, it, it's not really working in the right way. So it is just giving me uh, an outcome. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this and put it over here. So that's also something that I can do. In the rename inside, I, can, uh, I could have used in place equal to one also. Now, I have one uh, Y Fred uh, uh, final, okay? Now what I'm going to do, uh, what I need to do uh, is that I have to re-index the axis, okay? I have to re-index the axis so that it is organized, okay? It is organized basis the columns which I have, okay? Rather than it being organized using this index, I can organize it basis the columns which I have. So what I can do is that Y Fred final uh, is equal to y pred final dot re uh, I think re index axis was uh, re index axis should be there man mm, data frame has no attribute re index axis okay uh, I think it is already decommissioned from uh this or re index should be just a function or what let's see re index okay uh let me see if this is the same function in the latest version i believe it is not yeah new index with optional filling logic yeah this is the one that i have to use they have just renamed it i don't know why okay so what i'm going to do um here i need to mention all the columns so i have three columns and in each of the column, I'm going to say the first column is going to be cust ID. I will just rearrange things. So that is all I'm doing, okay? I'm just rearranging things, okay? Basis without uh, disturbing the index, okay? So that I don't mix the data. So the data belonging to one row should now not land into another row and so on. So that is why I'm doing something like this. So it is now uh, ready. And what I can do is that I can put it over here. And now what I can do is I can do a Y red final and do a head. And I could see some of the results are here, right? Now what I'm going to do, I have to do a final uh, a predicted thing. So, right, Y red final, I'm going to say final predicted. Okay, what is going to be my threshold? My threshold is going to be applied on y red final dot churn prob. And it should be a map function where I'm going to say lambda x. Uh, give me one if x is greater than 0 0.3 L0. Right? So this is exactly what I'm doing. Right? Or should I do something else? So maybe I'm just going to go ahead with 0 0.3. Whatever I have found in my in my S days, right? Now I have <coughs> now I have a simplistic thing, the churn uh, probability and the final predicted uh, value. Now what I'm going to do, matrix dot accuracy score and I'm going to use y pred final dot uh, churn 
which is the actual value. Okay, which is the actual value, and then I'm going to say compare this with y pred final dot predict final predicted value. Okay, compare this and give me the accuracy. You see what is the problem here? Here I have a very very less accuracy in place. Okay, I have really very less accuracy. So this is a problem, and I would like you to tell me what this problem is. I'm not going to tell you what is the problem here, or maybe we can play around with with. Uh, things here so for example i can do 0 0.4 and then my accuracy is increasing and so on right but i don't know what is going to be the sensitivity and the specificity so uh, maybe if i do the 0 0.5 the accuracy is not increasing right if i do 0 0.4 i'll stick to 0 0.4 maybe just for the time being uh, the accuracy increased to 0 0.28 but if i use the same uh, threshold value as I've used in the test set or the, in the training set, I get an accuracy which is hardly 28%, right? Hardly 27% is the accuracy. So in the test set, I have lesser accuracy than the training set. Okay. Can any one of you tell me why is this so or what is this phenomenon known as? Biasness. Yes. Is there any other word? Any other specific word? Underfit. Yes. Yes. Right. So this is an underfitting problem. So what happens in case of an overfitting problem? If I have an overfitting model, okay. If I have an overfitting model, I'm not going to solve this. By the way, this was just an example to show you that there can be such problems. But it also depends on the data, it also depends on what kind of analysis I have done and so on. Right. So uh, maybe this model is not really usable, but we will see other examples also. So in case of overfitting, what happens is your training data. Okay. In case of overfitting, what happens is your training data. I'm sorry, Sarang, it would be overfitting actually. So training data is as the accuracy in training is more than that of testing. Right, so testing accuracy is less than the training accuracy. This is called overfitting and underfitting. Okay, underfitting is where, yeah, right? So, yeah, underfitting is where, uh, in the training data, I performed okay ish, or in the training data, my accuracy uh, is less than the testing set. So, in the testing set, my accuracy is more. Okay, so this is what is known as the overfitting problem and the underfitting problem. Here, we clearly have an overfitting problem we have performed very good in the testing data okay but uh, we have performed very good in the training data but not in the testing data so there are the, uh, many reasons uh, a few prominent reasons is the way we have scaled our data maybe the scaling was not done properly uh, so scaling can be one issue the usually scaling can be ignored in case of uh, um, such kind of uh, models right where um, what kind of uh, such kind of it's a models uh, where we are going to look at uh, the distance as a metric so for example here i have two classes given by zero and uh, square or cross and i have a decision boundary which is something like this so obviously because this is regression ultimately we are going to look at the distances it's right? so because this is a distance based model based on which this this line is finally decided basis all the mathematics you have done so, so that's why scaling is really very important here so scaling is not to be considered as a bad thing right it is not to be considered uh, as a bad thing to do but the other problems can be sampling so for example if i don't have good uh, trend test split okay if i don't have good amount of data split as training data and the testing data then these kind of problems can come Okay, uh, it can also come because of the fact that I, uh, why is the sampling so important is because let's say I have 80% uh, of data given to training and only 20% of data given to testing. And this is purely a random sample. Okay. So randomly I have selected 80% of my data, which is used for the training purposes. 20% of my data is used for the testing purposes. Now, there is no guarantee whether this 20% data really captures all the variations as we have seen in this 80% of data. Please make a note of this because this is what we are going to uh, solve using some of the techniques which we are going to learn. Right? So, 
one of the techniques to solve this problem okay uh, is to do a grid search cv okay a grid search cross validation or a k fold cross validation so we are going to use cross validation techniques to to solve this problem how we are going to do that is that i'll give you a quick idea right now but later on we are going to do a deep dive so just imagine you have a data set which has one two three and four rows okay simple data you have in total four rows and you have to apply a machine learning model obviously your sample is less than 30 and it is really very less i mean number four is really very small how do you do that now one method to ensure you have good sampling in place okay is that you can do something like this you can take the first row okay and take this portion as the training data and th this portion as the testing data right so what i mean by that is let's say let me just do a control z maybe this was not the right way to represent let me get back and draw a columns let's say you have one two three four and five columns so you have one two three four and five columns and now you want to do a good sample of the data how do you do is that one of the ways is this this is known as k, uh, k fold cross validation way so you take the first four cells of the first row as the training data and the last one as the testing data or the last two as the testing data maybe i'm just going to again draw this so i'm i'll take the first three cells uh, as the training data four and five as the testing data so you might be wondering why am i ignoring the columns right so it should ideally be the opposite so i will take the first uh, three rows right i will take the first three rows as my training data right and the fourth one as my testing data right so i have taken three rows as my training data and i have taken one row as my testing data right i have created a model with this okay i have created a model which is m1 now i will create one more model and in the next model what i'm going to do this is what i'm going to do in the next model i have row number two to four right row number two to four which is my training data and row number one has now become my testing data using this i have created model number two okay in the same way let's say i will create another uh, model which is uh, model number three where one three and four row numbers one three and four is becoming my training data and row number two is becoming my testing data and that model becomes let's say model three so in this way you see i am creating multiple models rather than doing one i am doing multiple then i select the one which is actually giving me the better results or which is having a very composed output with respect to accuracy as well as the uh, precision and recall as well as the sensitivity and the specificity and so on so i compare all the metrics of all these uh, models and then we decide which model to choose or we use a technique this is really advanced i should not be telling you this right now but just for information there is a technique which is also known as ensemble methods right in case of ensemble what we do is that rather than picking one model we are going to take the average of all the models so what this ensemble essentially means is that let's say you are in a class okay you are in a class and i put a, a good toy in front of you let's say this is a toy okay and there are four people in the class if there are four people in the class and three out of four people are saying this toy is good then i'm going to mark this toy as good right but if i place another toy in front of you let's say this is toy one and this is toy two i place another toy in front of the same four students now three out of four students are saying this toy is bad right then i take the voting average and i say no this toy is bad for my class Right. So in the same way, what Ensemble does is, in this case, I'll create multiple models and I'll take the voting. If let's say two out of these three models are saying that this customer, okay, is is actually going to not churn, right? So the value for this customer ID is going to be not churn. Let's say this is not the predicted value, okay? So this is close to zero, okay? If two out of three models is saying this is close to zero, then I assume that it is zero. 
right now but these are advanced things this is one way to solve the problem this is called k fold cross validation we are going to look into this from the next uh, uh, things that we are going to do we are going to look at some more classification algorithms and this is a bit advanced we will look into these later but i think as of now what i'm going to do i'm not going to solve this problem for this use case okay for this use case i'll not solve it i'll stop here my use case is done i just wanted to leave this use case with the problem so that we can solve it uh i hope the explanation was clear right friends if you have any questions please let me know or else we can we have come to a logical end of this logistic regression thing i've shared all the information i had on this there is much more to learn actually uh, linear regression and logistic regression is by far the most commonly used uh, business models they are simple they are easy to do and they are very simple to interpret as well so that's what makes them really easy you see the kind of code that we have written here right they are very very rudimentary they don't have any uh, i mean i mean they they don't really have any complexity and without any complexity in my code i was able to not only build my model i was able to find out the metrics i was able to look at the outcome of the model row by row and so this this kind of easiness will not be there in the next set of models that we are going to do unfortunately because the higher the complexity of the model lower is the explainability of the model any questions from you sarang or rohit uh, no questions okay then let's do one thing let's make it a close uh, we will continue from tomorrow from tomorrow we will try to understand maybe we are going to take some use cases from the kaggle website and we will try to understand one of the most artistic way of doing a classification algorithm in which case we will draw a tree we will draw a tree to understand how a tree like structure will help us to do decision making it will be similar to the kind of uh, Uh, algorithmic diagrams which we may have already studied earlier so the tree like structure is going to define the steps that we will take or the model is going to look like a tree right so we will start with those okay friends i think we can close the session now thank you yes good no, night thank you thank you so much good night, good night. thank you